Okay. Then we uh, continue with uh, with the two last lectures that I gave. One was on um, on uh, road transport, uh, where <coughs> the main message is that costs are moderate per unit, so and uh, the supply of capacity is very flexible. Um, it's a very competitive industry, the trucking industry, extremely competitive. Um, provides door-to-door -door solutions, commonly with no consolidation on the way. Uh, but the door may be connected to a terminal. So you may have a feeding of, uh, from road transport into a terminal and then on from there with uh, either other trucks where the where the containers are, are consolidated uh, by rail or by sea. Creates pressure on the road capacity in many areas and uh, hence the external effects from, uh, from, uh, from road transport is, is, an, uh, is an issue of concern. And to, but before I continue now, just uh, before I forget it, um, there was one question that was raised uh, during the last break, I think. Whether you need, and this is a practical matter, whether you need to make references to the literature when you write the abstract of your assignment. If you have written your assignment, you are going to make an abstract. Do you need to make references in the abstract? And the answer is no. You don't have to do that. Just write the, write the abstract and, uh, and uh, you don't need to take care of, of any references there, or make any references there. That was the first. The other one is slightly more to the, to the course. When, I, when we discussed uh, shipping and, uh, and uh, our maritime transport and environmental issues, a, a valid question at the exam might be something like, what do you need to take into consideration when doing uh, comparisons between uh, different transport modes with respect to, to um, energy use and or emissions? Or something like this, uh, set up a, a simple model for how you would carry out a comparison between different transport modes. And the literature that you have at hand, combined with the lecture notes, should give you enough, enough material to do that. Um, yeah, so that will be kind of the approach that might be uh, taken to, to uh, let's say, examine you on that, on that issue. Um, back to this. I went through some issues connected to, to, uh, to how we can uh, deal with congestion in terms of, of pricing to make the correct charges for road transport when capacity is an issue, road capacity. Uh, and you have, you have much of the same if you think about it. If you think about this topic, this, this, this scheme, uh, in terms of uh, what, will ha what happens when you are going to buy a ticket to take, uh, to take um, air transport from here to Oslo or anywhere else. This pricing regime is actually what you are exposed to there. Because if there are, is a lot of excess capacity, they will charge you equal to a kind of a short run marginal cost to be able to fill, fill the aircraft. Because uh, at least they make, they make a slight amount of money. They charge you perhaps slightly above short run marginal costs. To be, able to, to be able to cover some of the fixed costs of that flight. But once <coughs> the plane starts to be, be filled up, or they see that the demand is quite strong, they increase prices. And if the demand is high enough, 
so that you really need to charge a lot to to not to not observe uh, any or that the market allows you to to charge above long run marginal cost which inclu includes the capital costs you will add an additional departure simply you will extend cap uh, expand capacity and uh, <coughs> that kind of capacity is not that expensive. I mean, to to you don't even need to perhaps buy another aircraft. You can just ex, uh, extend the number of departures. But, we, but if you talk about the road capacity, <coughs> you're talking about uh, heavy heavy investments. So this is just a, a very simple peak load pricing scheme that uh, that allows you to uh, to discuss what will happen to the road transport in the congested network and will that have any impacts on competition between transport modes. Um, talked a bit about rail transport, market structure. Um, where you have also high fixed costs. The railways are often monopolies due to high fixed costs, the, the, but you may have competition on, on the rails, different train companies, which may, uh, may, may use the same railway. Um, a bit back in the old days, with focus on production and not so much on the market. Uh, if you are very production oriented, you are focusing on being kind of kind of efficient to make the production of the rail services safe and secure and, uh, and perhaps even to, to a rather low cost. But you may not be market oriented. Uh, in that respect, because you may not uh, offer departures at uh, at convenient times that are demanded by the customers, and and so on and so forth. Also, <coughs> the market orientation for uh, for uh, rail companies has also to do with to what extent they ex engage in other activities as a part of the transportation uh, supply chain like being uh, engaged in terminal activities, cooperation with, uh, with the trucking companies to feed cargo in, and so on. This is about to change. I showed you, uh, sorry, I showed you the retrack project. I showed you also different business models that can be applied to, to sort of uh, establishing a better working or better functioning uh, supply chain where uh, consolidators, transport, uh, rail companies, uh, railway operators uh, sort of play together to, to make this, uh, this, this rail chain more efficient. And consolidation, as for sea transport, consolidation is actually important here as well because uh, you have ex uh, even if you don't have economies of scale to to the same extent as for a ship you have uh, you have scale effects within the rail sector as well so to to to, to have high volumes is is quite important We also, I also showed you this one, <coughs> which is uh, a diagram with, uh, with the total amount of cargo along the x-axis. You have this uh, straight line, which is the cost curve for road transport with congestion. The more you get on the road, the slower the speed gets, to, to put it that way, because you have some subcapacity problems. You have rail, or you can apply the same illustration to sea transport with increasing returns to scale, where 
the first unit is extremely expensive to, to, to transport, but when you, when you get out in this area, it's, uh, it's quite low because of uh, high volume, and uh, you can share the fixed costs on to, to, uh, to a high, uh, high amount of, uh, of, or a high amount of cargo. So the idea here is that uh, you need to be on this level, at least on this level, to have uh, an equilibrium where the costs of road and rail transport are equal. In, at this point, you have a lot on road and you have something on rail. But once you reach this point and you are able to attract more cargo, the rail company becomes more competitive up to this point. So there is a self-reinforcing thing going on here. If you manage to pass this critical mass point, and this may seem very theoretical, but if you think about it, if you manage to coordinate, and that's why we have, uh, we have uh, consigners and, uh, and uh, people who can take care of uh, of um, merging different cargo flows together to reach sufficient volumes to be able to to uh, to set up a train service, rail service, or or a, or a sea a sea freight service. And the shift here is simply different cost levels. So if you manage to to make the rail service or sea transport service more competitive you shift the curve downwards and you don't need that much cargo to be at this point, which is where you start to become competitive. So what can cause this shift? That may be that you can share the fixed costs onto, as I said, onto different types of activities. The same cost function can be applied to a port as a part of a, of a, of a transport chain. And if you manage to, to allocate some of the fixed costs to, let's say, other activities than just transportation. If suddenly you are able to, to win a contract that you can also set up a, a business within the port to, to do something somewhere other type of service, like packing, packing or something, you get this shift. And then you don't need to, and the point is that then you don't need to charge so much for the transportation throughput. Because you, you make money on something else too. That's why this, uh, this, this effect may, may, uh, may occur. Another way of, of creating this is of course to, to, to become more efficient to utilize your equipment in a better way and so on. But <coughs> the discussion uh, on, on transferring cargo from, let's say, trucks to short sea shipping is actually very much a question or a discussion about reaching this point. To consolidate enough cargo to get the uh, rail service or a sea service going with a, with a sufficient amount of quality or level of service. And when I'm talking about level of service, I can translate that into departure frequency. Because trucks are running all the time, <coughs> a ship may use a week to, uh, to, to be filled up with a sufficient amount of cargo. And that is, uh, in many cases, not not satisfactory. Then the final lecture <coughs> on freight planning. I just showed you a few uh, a few points um, why it's difficult to forecast freight because you have uh, you have uh, private information um, and so on. Um, they control many segments of the supply chain, which, uh, which may make it difficult to forecast the flows because there are other 
factors that affect the flows, not only minimum transport costs, but it may also be certain terminal functions and so on, which may make this, uh, which makes this a bit, uh, a bit uh, difficult. The planning, stepwise planning process, which we went through on, <coughs> last week. Uh, with, uh, with um, uh, identifying needs, pull in necessary resources, set up uh, goals and objectives, and go through this, uh, this stepwise process until you did come here, down here with uh, the implementation and uh, phase. We are actually carrying out the, the action that you are planning to do could be, for instance, this is sort of most suited for, uh, for long-term uh, capacity planning. And in the evaluation process, uh, location, for instance, can be one, one part of this. Then our air cargo. Uh, but before I start on that, I would think that when we discuss rail, road, intermodal transport, I might pose a question with respect to what are the cost stru structures of uh, rail sea freight versus road freight, and what are the challenges connected to transfer of cargo from road to sea or rail, rail transport? And the answer is given. Freight planning. <coughs> uh, I might ask questions about uh, what should you take into consideration when you set up a, when you set up a, a um, a uh, freight transport service going internationally with uh, uh, which needs quite a lot of uh, capital investment. Because if you don't need much of capital investments, if you can, let's say, lease in capacity let, like the airline does, uh, airlines do when they uh, when they expand to new new markets, they lease aircrafts. They can get rid of them within a not too long time span. It's quite flexible. But if you're going to invest in, uh, in, uh, in capital equipment, the story is slightly different. And then you need forecasts and you need, uh, you need a planning process, which looks something like that. Air cargo market, <coughs> I went quickly through the in this uh, lecture without any audience, uh, I went through some uh, characteristics of, of air transport, uh, where you have um, quite a lot of the, of the freight transported in, in passenger aircraft as a combined uh, carrier. Uh, <coughs> um, but you have some dedicated types of aircraft uh, that uh, is needed for heavy, heavy volumes. Types of air transport rates. I ended this with, uh, with, um, with an example of calculating chargeable weight. Because then we, I just translated or transferred goods that are, have a large volume, but which are lightweight. And if you just charge per kilo for lightweight cargo, you will not be able to, to sort of use the, pay, the, the maximum load that uh, an, uh, an airplane can take, because you fill up with, uh, with lightweight cargo. And then you may lose money as compared to a situation where you can, can use the carrying capacity 
uh, efficiently. Therefore, lightweight goods needs to be more expensive per kilo than heavyweight goods. So that's the logic behind that uh, chargeable weight example. It's very simple. Okay, that's about it, I think. Uh, are there any questions? I've tried to mention a few possible topics that might be asked at the exam. You have got two exam sets uh, posted on Fronter uh, with a disclaimer saying that the readings have changed. Uh, some of those uh, topics may, not, may be uh, slightly outdated. Uh, one of the questions goes uh, on calculating uh, economic factors connected to container transportation that will not be given this time because we haven't I know that Harald Dele hasn't been through that that part uh, so uh, but uh, if you read, read through the exam sets perhaps try to answer some of the questions and then pay attention to what I have said and which is recorded so that you can go back and listen I think you should be quite well off. All right. Good luck to you with your assignment and your exam. <laughs>